One of the common questions that comes up is how I got involved in this whole movement since I live in a rural area, and since migration questions are largely urban ones, or at least have been in the past, they're much more rural now than they used to be. I was born in Detroit of a father who was Canadian. He had come to the United States in the early 1930s after he finished university looking for a job. He called himself a nickel immigrant because it cost a nickel to take the boat across the Detroit River from, from uh, Sarnia to the Detroit side. And my mother was a farm girl, the first in her family to go away to school. She became a registered nurse, and they met in her nursing job in Detroit and got married in 1933, I guess it was. And I appeared on the scene a year or so after that. We moved to that family farm in 1945. I remember the day well, February 1, 1945, before the Second World War was over. And we were able to get some farm equipment, even though it was rationed in that time. And I was basically raised as a farm boy then from age 11 on. It was probably the best thing that happened to me in my life because I learned to work with my hands and to try to beat the weather and get the crops into the bin. And, and I came out of it with a love of the land, which is basically my organizing principle. When I uh, went to Michigan State University in 1952, I signed up in the School of Agriculture. I, I loved the land and working the land. I loved growing things, and I thought I wanted to work in agriculture somehow or other. So I became a, a student of soil science or agronomy. But on my father's side of the family, there had been professional and business people and several doctors. And my mother was a registered nurse, and she had this dream of having a son who was a physician. So that combined with the fact that I did quite well academically in my first two years at Michigan State led me to switch to a medical pre-medical degree, which I finished in 1956. And from thence, I went to the University of Michigan Medical School, which I graduated from in 1960. Went to Colorado for my internship year, 60-61, in Denver. Then back to the University of Michigan, 61-64, for my training as an ophthalmic, ophthalmic surgeon. And then in 1964, um, looking for a place to practice now that I'd finished my training, uh, I learned there was a job opening in little Petoskey, Michigan, right up towards the tip of the mitt of the hand up here, right on the shores of Lake Michigan. I, by that time, had married a farm girl, so we both wanted to live in the rural area, so we took that position. I stayed there for 34 years, retired in 1998. I'm still active in the immigration reform movement as a board member of FAIR, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, which I co-founded back in 1979. Uh, Subsequent to that, other groups have been formed. One was called uh, just Common U.S. Inc., and I'm chairman of that, and it, it sponsors a symposium once a year called the Writer's Workshop, which we're in town for this weekend. I'm on the board of a group called Pro-English, which is a subsidiary group that came out of the whole language and immigration population question. There's the role of language in a society, so we're working on that aspect of it. And then I do a great deal of work trying to encourage young writers coming along, trying to find new board members. The original board members are all getting a little long in the tooth, and we need to find our s s substitutes before too long. So I'm still actively involved in writing. I also am the publisher of a magazine called The Social Contract, which we started about 16 years ago. It's a quarterly journal. started on the theory that every social change movement needs to have a house organ where you can publish seminal pieces where new writers coming along can break into print alongside established writers and another way to communicate ideas. So I'm still very actively involved. I'm retired as an ophthalmologist now, but I spend four, sometimes five days a week in the office most of the day, dealing with emails, writing things, trying to think, think about what we should be doing next. And public life, beekeeping has sort of set me apart, I guess, a little bit from most of the urban folks that I spend my time with. And it seems exotic to a lot of people, and they're interested in these stories about how the hive works. And of course, at the end of that, I can give them a bottle of honey. Looking good. I got started beekeeping back in high school. My maternal grandfather was on the scene at the farm where I was raised on. He kept bees. I was looking for him to make some money. So he got me started, loaned me some equipment and so on. That was back when honey was 25 cents a pound. Now it's about Five dollars a pound, I think it is. Beekeeping has sort of fits in one of my other prime interests, which is the population conundrum that's faced by humanity. We all know about the exponential increase in, that's taken place in the last hundred years or so. And the same thing happens each year in the, in the buildup of the bees in the hive. But the thing we don't notice about human population that we see in the beehive is that there's an exponential decrease toward the end of the year. This time of year, the worker bees are throwing the drones out to starvation and death. And the... Uh, 
numbers are going down to maybe about a tenth of what they were during the height of the season. And they'll stay down there at the bottom of that bell-shaped curve until they build up again the next spring. So it's a cyclical thing that's normal and uh, it raises interesting questions about the human enterprise.